how do we as society think about older people? How do we think about older people in the context of technological change and dig digitalization? With the rising relevance and prevalence of social media, artificial intelligence, global communications, the global, global exchange of ideas and the spread of ideas, when new cycles often renew within hours or minutes and when we as individuals are expected to keep track of yearly new versions of smartphones, streaming services or voice assistants. When we as society increasingly place hopes on technological change to help us address climate change or the challenges in our healthcare systems. When mastering and understanding technological change and digitalization increasingly become prerequisites to be seen as a full member of society. How do we think about older people, indeed? Well, this is an example for a very common way of how we think about older people. It's an example from a healthcare policy document. And what we see here is that older people are seen as a burden to our health and care systems. And technological innovations are then introduced as a potential solution for that. And with this also commonly questions are being raised as to how technologies can actually help older people, can support older people in engaging in more preventative lifestyles or in the self-management of disease or in simply coping with disease. The problem with this, of course, is that it addresses older people not as citizens or consumers, but as potential patients and care recipients. And with this comes another widespread assumption about older people. That older people are not interested in the fancier, the newer, the shinier versions of new technology, but that older people are laggards. Laggard users of technology that are late in adopting new technologies and for whom special arrangements need to be made so that they can remain full members of the digital society. And we know from our research that both these assumptions, older people as a burden to health and care systems and older people as laggard users of technology are widespread. And they often lead to technologies specifically designed for older people that address and reduce older people to deficits and problems. Let me give me an example for that. This is Mr. Ba. Mr. Ba last year made, widely made the news, also here in the Netherlands, as the robot that catches grandma when she falls. And indeed, Mr. Ba is a robot, as you can see here. And he uses a wide range of sensors and algorithms to follow people around, to detect when they are, fall, detect when they are about to lose balance, and then catch them when they fall. And indeed, falls among older people are known to be an important driver of healthcare costs. So designing technological interventions for the prevention of falls seems to be a very sensible thing to do. And Mr. Ba, for sure, has shown in carefully crafted laboratory environments that he is good at doing that, preventing falls. I don't think that the future will see many Mr. Bars in actual homes and actual lives of older people. Also not in actual nursing homes, but not because Mr. Ba is bad at what its designers expected him to do. Remember, he is good at catching fallers, but because he so fundamentally misunderstands the lives of most older people, which are here expected to have a robot, a clumsy robot, follow them around in their homes at all times. <laughs> well, Mr. Ba is a somewhat obvious, probably somewhat extreme example, of course, here. But it exemplifies well a common problem that technologies have that are designed with the older people as laggard users idea in mind. They imagine the lives of older people to revolve around medical and care needs, and then assume older people to be undemanding and incompetent enough to accept a whole range of clumsy, strange, somewhat alienating technologies in their lives. These technologies, therefore, contribute to and reinforce what the WHO 
and many other international organizations and activists call ageism. They contribute to and reinforce negative stereotypes, discrimination, and prejudice towards older people. What if I told you that actual empirical research into the technology lives of older people, into the lives of older people and their relations with technologies and technological change, tells us a very different story? Well, I'm a social scientist. I work in the social science and humanities department. And you may wonder why, why, why I am interested in technological change, digitalization. Why I speak to you about older people as users of technology. Well, the answer to that is actually quite simple. To me, technologies, new and old, are at their core cultural objects. They need to be researched, understood, and they shape the everyday lives and cultures in which, they, in which they are being used and in which they need to find a meaningful space. And I do study tech technologies as such. So let me give you a quick and, and, and simple example, which is the smartphone. When Steve Jobs introduced it back in 2007, he envisioned it to be a mobile device for placing calls, checking emails, and accessing the World Wide Web. Essentially existing stuff by different means. Hardly did he foresee how we, you and I, users, consumers of smartphones, would define a completely new culture of mobile communications. A culture that we now take for granted when we access social media or when we use a whole range of WhatsApp groups in the organization of our daily lives. With this in mind, Remember that I just told you that I want to give you a different view on older people and their relations with technology and technological change. And again, I'm using an example for this. And it is, a, it is an example that you're all familiar with, I assume. The electrical bike or simply e-bike. Because also in the short history of the e-bike, something unforeseen happened. Because today, more e-bikes are being sold than regular bikes, at least here in the Netherlands and in other countries of the global north. But 15 years ago, the situation was markedly different. E-bikes then were clumsy devices, clearly marked by large invisible batteries and motors as assistive devices. And early uses and early sales of e-bikes were strongly associated with older people that needed the as additional assistance in paddling. And in the wider public, hardly anybody would consider e-bikes as the worthy competitor to regular bikes. So how did this change then? How can we explain that over the last 10 to 15 years, e-bikes have become such a successful product among all age groups? Well, we did research into that exact question. And in that research, we talked to nearly all Dutch e-bike manufacturers. And in these interviews, we found something really remarkable. Because those that were actually designing e-bikes back in the day, those companies we talked to, they didn't see their early older customers as users of a special variant of a regular bike. Instead, they saw these early customers, these older customers, and their assistive devices, their e-bikes, as an inspiration for innovation and a starting point for learning. And this marks a really important shift. Because in this case, older people do not appear as laggard users for a somewhat strange bike but they appear as, as what we call early adopters. Early adopters of a new and innovative technology. Early adopters whose practices of e-biking, whose practices of using the e-bikes, would tell important lessons
for the future of that very innovation, the e-bike. So what happened here exactly in this case? Well, the e-bike designers of the time, they didn't perceive of their older customers in terms of a lack of strength or stamina, but rather they looked into the e-bike and their roles in the lives and everyday lives of these early customers. So the whole breadth of roles that the e-bike fulfilled in the lives of the older people came into sight through that perspective. And these roles for sure included assistance with pedaling. Early e-bikes were already quite good at that. But the e-bikes were having many more roles in, these, in the lives of these older cu customers as well. As sportive devices, as fun and recreational devices, as something to brag about or to tinker with, or simply as a means to commute to work or to the care of grandchildren. And with these different roles that the e-bikes had in the lives of their customers, also different directions for change and different futures for the e-bike came into sight as well. So innovation happened towards smaller batteries, smaller motors, better integrated in the frames of the bike, and fancier, more appealing designs became possible. But all this only happened because these designers had a much broader view on the role of e-bikes in the life of older customers. So older people as early adopters, indeed. Well, why is this relevant? For me, it marks a really important shift. A shift where some researchers, some technology developers, some policy makers, me included as researcher, are trying to define and and explore new narratives of older people and their relations with technology and technological change. Narratives that are based on actual empirical research on the technical lives and technology lives of older people. The encounters of real older people with real technologies in their everyday lives. And this shift is based on a recognition, partially on the fact that technologies that are designed with the older people as laggard narrative in mind, quite often miss the mark. They don't scale, they don't deliver what people actually would like to have. But more importantly, based on the recognition that these technologies, with the older people as, as laggard narrative in mind, are actually ageist, and they are based on ageist assumptions and stereotypes, rather than on what we actually know about the lives of older people and the role of technologies within these lives. So the e-bike case involves a really important lesson. It invites us to think about a much richer, a much more nuanced, a much more diverse, and much more positive imaginary of older people and their relations with technology and technological change. In particular in societies in which technological change and digitalization are and are considered to be as important as in ours. So wouldn't it be nice then, in the end, if we would think of older people not as obstacles to societal change and innovation, but as potential drivers of positive change in society? To not complain about demographic change, but rather embrace and explore it as an opportunity? To not marginalize or even blame older people in our discussions of societal challenges, but include them as valuable and productive contributors in the making of solutions. Thank you. <clears throat>